a koutou tatoa, ko Summer Rangi Māori e tōku ingoa. Kia ora everyone, my name is Summer and I'm delighted to be hosting this session in the Sustainable Healthcare and Climate Health, sorry, Aotearoa webinar series today. Um, Dr. Jeff Kidder will be speaking about health equity and access to food. And you will notice a question and answer box um, in the Zoom user interface that you can type your questions into throughout the session and we'll answer them at the end. And with that, I'll hand you over to Jeff. Kia ora, Jeff. Tēnā tātou, ko Jeff Kira Tako Ingoa. I'm a uh, uh, senior lecturer at Massey University. Um, we've been doing food security research for the last five years now. Uh, and uh, I thought I'd present a, a bit about what we're trying to achieve um, and where we're going uh, for the next uh, few years, hopefully. Uh, I'll just share my screen, get the presentation started. So um, the, the basis around what we're trying to achieve in uh, the food security uh, area is looking at equity. That's our main um, uh, place we, we've been uh, doing research in, um, cardiac rehab also, and uh, physical activity. So um, uh, there's quite a broad range of equity uh, focus that we have. Um, however, in the food security uh, uh, vein, because we're public health, we're looking at sustainability and climate change uh, also to be included. So it actually makes it really complex uh, to be able to uh, um, address uh, food security. Um, however, um, it's not an insurmountable challenge and there's several ways that we can, we can get around that. So um, globally for food security, there is a, uh, for many countries actually, whether they're developing or developed countries, there's a, there's a double burden um, of having hunger and undernutrition, but also overweight and obesity in the same nation. Um, and it's no different for uh, New Zealand. We do have a, um, uh, a, a small percentage, but a percentage of, of uh, Kiwis that uh, are, um, uh, in hunger um, and uh, having to be uh, uh, given uh, charitable services to be able to get through their day. So we have uh, around 800 million people starving at the moment in the world. However, we do actually have enough food to feed, feed everyone in the world at this point in time. When we get to something like 2050, um, when we have around 9 billion people in the world, um, we're not too far off that at the moment. Um, and that's when the, the, the uh, uh, food supply chain will be put under even more pressure. And, um, uh, and even at the moment, uh, we have one in three people um, having some form of malnutrition um, in the world. And so um, the food supply is... Um, partially sufficient in terms of calories, but in terms of nutrients, it's quite quite poor. Uh, there's there's really no new land for agriculture. We can't afford to give up more land um, because the uh, carbon sequestering uh, uh, um, ability for uh, forests and um, other uh, land-based uh, um, uh, features, um, uh, we can no longer... Um, till up land and um, uh, have more land um, being put towards uh, livestock. Um, we we uh, believe that or estimate that about 70% of the world will be urbanized by 2050. So that's a, a lot of the world. Um, and that means that that new land for agriculture will be uh, very much um, uh, decreased. And then um, on the, based on the population estimates for the next 35 years, we'll have to produce as much food as we have ever in human history. So that's a massive amount of food. Um, and uh, whether we can do that is, uh, is a very uh, perplexing question for everyone um, trying to be able to um, produce more from less. Sorry about the font size here, but there's a lot to get through. So uh, the local um, uh, food security is issue, um, as some of you probably do know already, um, one in five children living in households experiencing severe to moderate food insecurity um, uh, from our uh, Ministry of Health um, Health Survey. And uh, that food insecurity more prevalent am uh, among children who are living in deprived neighbourhoods. And that's, uh, that's no um, surprise because uh, poverty is a... Um, a real uh, big issue uh, for food security. Um, there's a usually, um, well, usually it, it's 
higher uh, prevalence of uh, primary caregivers and the benefit, uh, Pacific Māori ethnicity, um, sole parent, and those those households that children, those food insecure children are in, um, they're not meeting the fruit and vegetable consumption guidelines. We're looking for five plus a day. Um, uh, eat less breakfast at home. Um, are more likely to uh, consume fast foods and, and fizzy drinks, um, to be obese or overweight. So it's a conundrum of trying to feed people but actually getting poor nutrition in, in, at the same time. Um, and um, for, from my point of view in public health, um, that uh, obesity is, a, um, is simply an outcome of poor nutrition. Um, it's not just eating more calories, it's actually eating um, uh, poor, poor uh, or low nutrition food. We've um, experienced some system shocks um, for the food system and, and over the past few months uh, because of uh, COVID. And uh, we've probably all seen the news articles about Auckland City Mission, uh, Wellington City Mission, Salvation Army, um, the massive num the number of uh, uh, people uh, looking for food parcels um, from these charitable organisations. Um, they tripled and they quadrupled. It was a massive amount of food to be able to um, provide to people who couldn't uh, get to work. Um, and so um, even the pre-COVID advice here was uh, so we could avoid queuing. So this was um, in uh, early March um, by or, or leaning close to the, the lockdown. Um, they were asking people to utilize online ordering. But when we did do it, it the system crashed. Um, now, that wasn't because we couldn't uh, didn't have enough food, there was enough food, but the system couldn't deal with that many people ordering online. So it was a really interesting situation for us and it was made even worse for people living in uh, food insecurity purely because you know, um, most of the time they couldn't do online ordering. Um, they had to get out to the supermarket and even then um, still not being able to afford the food that was there. So this is just some um, uh, uh, a, a flick from foods, uh, food insecurity over to uh, climate change. Uh, and so what we're looking at here on the uh, left-hand side is the uh, contribution uh, by country or by region um, uh, to our uh, CO2 emissions, which is the, the greatest contributor to uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, we can see at the top of the left-hand graph, uh, China being um, the, the greatest contributor to uh, CO2 emissions. Um, that's no surprise because of their industry and because of um, uh, the world's de uh, demand on them to produce for us. Uh, and so our consumerism culture um, and uh, that's one way of reducing em emissions by reducing our consumer uh, culture. Uh, United States next. Asia Pacific, which is what we're part of, um, is the next one. So um, uh, interesting that, um, you know, where that might come from, probably uh, Australia and the um, industrial uh, Asian uh, nations in the Asia Pacific area. Um, if you look at the right-hand graph, this is looking at... Um, uh, a combination of greenhouse gas emissions and um, vulnerability to uh, climate change. And those um, in the top left-hand corner, which is the, um, the uh, dark uh, brown uh, color, uh, is uh, those that uh, have both high emissions and um, uh, high vulnerability. Uh, those in the uh, dark green, uh, low uh, emissions and low vulnerability to uh, uh, climate change. So um, interestingly, you know, the Northern America, uh, Australia and uh, Russia uh, are high, um, high uh, CO2 emissions, but also um, uh, they also have um, high vulnerability to climate change. So um, it's those nations in particular that need to make changes to their food system. New Zealand, we're not far behind, we're in the red. Um, so we need to actually make big changes since we're a, a food system contributor. We uh, export a lot of our food product. So um, the greenhouse gas emissions from food production is around 26%, uh, so a quarter of all um, food production. Uh, 
uh, sorry, a, a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from food production, and that can be food production for uh, livestock or food production for uh, humans. Uh, the supply chain is actually a very small part of that. 18% of all the um, uh, food-related greenhouse gas emissions go to um, our supply chain. They're actually, um, the, the global food system is actually very efficient at um, uh, transporting food. Um, part, of the, part of the problem that we have is this dependence on things like uh, meat and dairy. Um, and uh, that's why the uh, Eat Lancet recommendations are asking us to uh, reduce the amount of uh, meat and dairy product that we consume. Um, and there are arguments for and against that. Um, and uh, it's it's easier uh, if we just re reduced our uh, meat and dairy consumption. However, um, uh, trying to change uh, a New Zealand culture, for example, to move towards um, uh, a more plant-based diet, um, less uh, meat consumption, is uh, would not be an easy thing. But uh, we hope that we can be able to do that in the future. So the food system, it's a complicated thing. It is so complex. There are so many uh, uh, tensions and triggers and um, uh, barriers and facilitators within the system. It is really difficult to navigate. There are so many uh, uh, things we've got to take into account where we change something, uh, say we change to uh, our, a different way of agriculture. Um, it impacts on our um, uh, political system uh, where for legislation, for technology, um, and our retail outlets. So it is um, a very uh, live system and very evolving system, uh, changing all the time. What uh, food companies have done to be able to try and bypass this is to um, uh, uh, develop a system called vertical integration. Now, vertical integration is essentially owning the food system from, from paddock all the way to retail. So um, uh, food companies have pretty much uh, sewn up the system so they can be able to uh, uh, readily provide the food product that they, re they require to be able to sell on sell to the consumer. And so that makes for a very tight system. There is very little waste in that system. However, what it does do is introduce the corporate element into the food industry, which means that um, uh, the food companies have to uh, try and placate their shareholders, which means that it's the economy side of food rather than the value side of food. So uh, unfortunately, ethical and moral uh, dilemmas are usually put to one side because it's all focused on the economy. And so that's when we start getting pollutants in the uh, environment. We start um, not worrying about greenhouse gases. We start um, uh, using uh, uh, chemicals, fertilizers to be able to produce more and more and more. Um, and so our habitats are starting to be pushed out, um, taking up more agricultural land. So, so there's, there's um, those, those tensions uh, within the system uh, to make it more efficient, we've got to be less um, environmentally savvy, unfortunately. And so um, this is part of my problem where I'm trying to feed families, but, um, but we've got this pressure on the system to, to have to produce food and uh, do it in a cheap way. Uh, one other way that we can look at... Um, uh, uh, improving the system is to be able to have what we call a local um, uh, uh, food system. Um, the food and agricultural organization uh, are big on trying to um, uh, encourage um, community food systems and um, uh, we can have this as a circular economy. It brings money into the, uh, into the local area. So the, um, uh, this is the um, setup for a, a food supply chain. It sits within a, uh, 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 an environment of um, society, economy, and um, the local environment, including things like greenhouse gases and uh, waste disposal. Uh, society issues are food security, health and well-being, culture, um, a, and the economy, uh, looking at the use of byproducts from food supply, um, employment, 
economic growth and um, use of in renewable energy. One of the things that we had to do to try to do is um, find out um, if we were to be able to provide healthy food to, um, uh, to people living in, in deprivation, living in poverty, would they actually eat the food? Now, this was, this was a, a no-brainer to me. I thought, of course. Of course they would eat it. However, um, this is a question that we actually got from funding um, uh, agencies um, that were questioning what we were trying to achieve with, with uh, addressing food security. So we put together a Hepataka Marohi. It's a, um, it was an Explorer grant application. Um, we looked at um, the uh, Palmerston North um, uh, city, and if you can see the down to the left-hand bottom side, that's a uh, high deprivation area in the purple. And we focused on that area to be able to, uh, for the study. And in the study, um, we had uh, it was very high deprivation. Um, the yearly household income uh, for most of them, or two thirds of them, was uh, less than twenty thousand um, dollars a year, and so they were paying rent with that. Um, so it was pretty um, unbelievable that they could actually um, uh, have uh, any diet at all. To be honest, um, high density Maori population, uh, low income households, of course, I said that, and um, they are either renting or have unstable domicile. And, and by saying that, it's um, when they uh, when they're in state housing and the numbers uh, change within that household, then they have to move to a new household to be able to um, uh, keep in state housing. So it's a, it's quite unstable environment. So we had 40 households recruited. We gave them free, free fruit and veg for three months. Um, there was no fruit and veg store in the area. Um, and then for another three months, we offered them $5 bags of fruit and vegetables um, to see if they, uh, uh, how many bags that they would purchase. We found when we gave them the free fruit and vegetables, um, almost 90% uh, of the food was consumed, was used. 6% um, was uh, in waste and um, uh, 3% uh, were, or 3 to 4% were given away. So they're given away to neighbours and uh, family. So that's that manakitanga that we observed there. Um, and uh, they did try to um, purchase the fruit and vegetables, but even $5 bags of fruit and vegetables were, were too much. So even though they could, they could uh, consume 90% of the food, and this was five plus a day, so they were reaching the recommenda recommendations for fruit and vegetables, um, which uh, only a third of New Zealanders can actually reach um, at this point in time. Um, they were able to, to consume that um, uh, uh, recommended guidelines of fruit and vegetables, but they, they just did not have the income or disposable income to purchase the fruit and vegetables. So the next step for me um, is at the moment we're testing some uh, ways to um, measure dietary habits, uh, particularly fruit and vegetable consumption. Um, but uh, we want to map the food system. Now that's that's the conventional food system, uh, which is supermarkets and retail, etc. We want to be able to do that. We understand that um, you know Informus has already done um, some of this work, but um, we think that we can uh, do more. Um, there's also the complementary food system that needs to be mapped, which is more the um, uh, um, uh, free food, um, Salvation Army, uh, uh, food rescue. Um, we need to consider a value-based system. And so at the moment, we're exploring social enterprises around um, sustainable food systems that are in a local area. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, be able to um, uh, move forward with those to be able to feed families, but also um, regenerate the economy in the local area. All right, I've gone on way too long. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've finished now. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for your presentation today and for fielding all of these really interesting questions. Um, and so, sorry that we don't have the time to answer the rest of them, but if you would like to send your question through to Jeff, you can do that. Um, I think his email might be attached to the online link or website for this webinar. So thank you again, Jeff, and it's been a pleasure to facilitate this session today.